Hello there and welcome to a new video for Age of Wonders 4. In this one I am introducing 10 tips and tricks regarding army management, unit handling, army building, all those things which will help you in finding out how many troops you require, pulling off some nice little tricks with these guys, stuff like that. So let's get started with number one while we're at the nice tricks. So here is a typical situation that you might find yourself into. So we have a lot of enemy camps around us, but we don't want to spend endless amounts of time. So there is a really neat little trick. So you just select one of your units, preferably one of the faster moving ones, and then you send them over there. So if you hover now the enemy army, you see that red blotted line there. So that means if I now stand here, this guy can take that fight and these guys will join. Now we can take that even a step further and send one troop over here. So we would have finished this fight, then we send this guy over. Then we remerge. And if you check it out not like that, the square is a little bit hard of perceivable, but you see we can take two armies like that. And then next turn, we can easily take that fight there as well by just splitting off smaller parts of our army and move them autonomously. We can also take this fight down here, for example. So I just want to mention how much flexibility in your army movement you have there when you split them out in a uh, in a certain area that red area here oh, it's a little bit hard to see right now but yeah the uh, red dotted line is uh, you can't see there so let's get it over here so this red dotted line there so as long as the troops are inside this radius the battle will always be joined that means you have a lot more action radius than you actually think in the first place. This strategy is extremely valuable also during siege situations where you can split off your troops and plunder those provinces just uh, easily with one unit while your main troops are, are doing the siege thing. So let's get on over to number two. I want to talk about the fact that you always should have enough armies for your empire. What are enough armies for your empire, you might ask? Well, that's the hard part about the question. So first of all, you should always try to have a defensive army for each city slash front. So I see here, for example, Nightwatch has a front into this direction here. So it should have an army. This city here, Solyndra has the same problem into this direction, also needs a defensive army. Dominance is within the defensive area of these two cities, so they don't really need their own army. You should always have one, uh, one army per war, and beyond that, well, it really depends on your situation. If you are against a lot of uh, AI enemies, you need a different um, amount of armies than when you are against humans. In general, the movement of the AI is much easier foreseeable, and humans are an entirely different kind of worms. But in a grand total, try to have one army per front and one army per war. And on top of that, adapt it to your own situation, liking and play style. But you won't fare too wrong with these uh, general numbers here. So number three, I want to talk about the uh, composition of units in one banner and how to do it the best way. So. First of all, there is uh, no real best way until you exactly know what your enemy is uh, looking like. So the moment you see what the enemy is uh, composed of, you can build up a perfect counter to that. Before you know what you're facing, it's impossible to have perfect army. That's really important. Therefore, my personal ideal approach is, how, is to have banners that are as balanced as possible. Here's one example that I pulled off here. So the, this banner is exactly 50-50 spread up in ranged and melee. The hero is a ranged physical attacker. We have one battle mage and we have one supporter. I don't see the supporter really as damage dealer, so we have two ranged pure damage dealers and this guy, well, he, he deals damage, but he's not exactly there. This is not his, uh, his primary job. Then we got three units here. Here again, it's all melee. One guy straight up offensive as a shock trooper. One guy more on the defensive side. The pole arm units are pretty uh, nice in defense. You could also have a shield unit here. And one fighter as some stance in between. 
Here, of course, this is a typical Jack of all trades and master of none situation. So these guys are good against everything, but not particularly good against anything either. So they won't be countered, but they don't counter either this way. Too hard, that is. The more specialization you put into a banner, the harder you counter some things, but the harder you get countered by other things. So it is a constant uh, weighing off of the situation. Here, for example, this squad is way more heavy in the offense and ranged and in melee, but they are a really, really good company to these guys. So to summarize, the ideal banner when you don't know what you're against is spread up 50-50, range, magic damage, mix it up as good as you can. Always bring at least one supporter if you can. If you don't can bring a supporter, bring at least eight. Uh, you can replace it with a shield unit, also not bad. And always take care that there is a good mix of offensive and defensive units. Generally, pick only 33% of your squad defensive, that's two units, and the rest should be be there to deal damage and you are quite well off you can adapt and tinker on this quite endlessly because you can summon units you can have foreign troops you can you have always a deferred roster but this rule of thumb applies into many areas and you can adapt it to your own playstyle quite easily i think so number four i want to talk about a certain playstyle that you can't pick up that is something that I call the hero ball. So hero units are quite fascinating. Not only can you define their mode of attack by equipping them with the regarding weapon, you can also totally specify which kind of skills they should have, passive and active. Therefore, founding an entire banner of, of heroes is a really, really cool and strong way to have a massively powerful army. This strategy, though, has its downsides. You will be very, very focused on one point, and I personally think it is a pretty good strategy in the uh, in AI plays. I don't think in PvP it is that much of a brilliant idea. I just want to point out that a hero ball is fun, and it clears out wonders really, really decently, because heroes can scale up much further than than your regular troops can so it's a pretty good idea to have lots of these um in one squad if you want to have some fun but uh, this is a very specific strategy that i just wanted to point out because i didn't find it too obvious and uh thanks to the comment section for that one because this is actually not my own my own idea but i played similar things since uh heroes and of might and magic 4 and yeah heroes are powerful and they're really good at wonders you can utilize you can utilize that by balling them together so number five I want to talk about the amount of troops. We talked about the amount of armies, but how many troops to put into these armies? That's a different question. So it's also a pretty difficult question. So I'm going to, to, to do my best to answer that. So your troop amount is always depending on your culture, your play style, and your victory goal. So if you are playing a defensive victory, you will need less units but you should try to have them of a higher quality, higher tier, so you can have a really, really adamant line of defense when you're trying to force through your magic victory, for example. The opposite thing is true if you are trying to go for a conquering and expansionistic victory. That's where you want to have a lot of troops because you want to cover a lot of ground and you want to spread out your uh, empire as far as possible. Therefore, you will need more troops. In this scenario, it pays really off to pay close attention to all the city improvements that give extra money and all those tiles that give extra money as well. So very, very important to note that you really should bring a lot of money if you are trying to have a lot of troops. Really important. The exact numbers differ from every game to every game. If you're playing against AI, if you're playing against uh, humans, there's totally big differences. How big is the map? How is the map composed? How many choke points are there? I can't really give you an exact number, therefore, but I hope these tips were a little bit of uh, food for thought here. So I want to talk on number six about legendary units. A legendary unit looks like this. They are at the end of their career, they can't 
have any more experience points and they are as powerful as they can possibly be these guys are really cool and they actually shouldn't be in your active armies anymore they are best off in the defensive line because they are as powerful as they can be whereas everybody else in your armies still has a lot more to learn so if you ever notice these diamond medals i just want to uh, give you this as an idea that you can use these guys for your core lands so you have really strong defenders there of the best quality and you bring those uh, fresh troops up to the front where they can gather the experience because your troops won't gain xp if they don't fight and therefore legendary units well if you have a hard fight ahead of you, by all means use them, but you should be aware of the fact that once this diamond medal pops up, they actually can't learn anything anymore, and if you value a elite unit or elite army in a grand total, you should exchange them. So, number seven brings me to the exact opposite of uh, that. I want to talk about expendables in your army. So, expendables can be summonable units or low tier one units, Units that generally you don't plan to have a long life in your army. Recruits like that. Sometimes it is just like that. You're fighting against a high tiered army, which has tier 4 to tier 5 units, and sacrifices have to be made. You know, you cannot avert all of the losses. Sometimes you just have to have somebody take the impact. And that's where. I want to talk about expendable troops, like stuff that you can just summon, or no tier 1 pe uh, recruits. These guys will not be missed too dearly, whereas if you lose your diamond uh, quality uh, guys there just by a random splat, that would be really, really annoying. Therefore, I really like to have certain parts of my army where I know if ever I need to tank something really nasty, which I'm not sure if it will kill off my dudes, I have some expendables. Ideally defensive units so they can take a little bit more impact but generally I want to uh, give you the um, the idea that you can have these parts in your army. Also really really good in that part in that regard are tactical spells which just summon randomly units. Also really cool in the same venue hero skills can also summon units. Some, uh, some of them can give you the ability to summon a unit per battle massively good because if you direct the losses onto something which you don't care about losing you're actually winning while you're losing troops that's a great thing so number eight i want to talk about streets and teleporters so streets can be built and, and teleporters are um, found in the general mastery tier and these are really really important once you have a large empire so when your empire grows really really large for example because you're planning to go for an expansionistic victory and these things teleporters can come in super handy to transport your armies from the well developed inner lands to the fronts where they are needed in a grand total i just want to recommend you in this uh, point that if you notice that your armies will require more and more turns to reach the front where they are needed Ro roads and teleporters are way to go to keep the logistics uh, as low as possible this is especially important when you're playing against humans against the ai well it's, it's it never hurts to have a good infrastructure but humans can really capitalize a uh, bad um, logistics line quite heavily so, number nine, I want to talk about your ability to gather foreign troops slash summons. So, every culture that you're playing has downsides. Currently, we're playing in this playthrough here, the dark culture. And these guys, for example, they come with the innate weakness of featuring not a single defensive unit in their roster. Their most defensive unit is the night guard. And pole arm units aren't exactly pure defensive either. They don't have any supporters, they don't have any shield units. The Rally of Liege or other um, methods of acquiring uh, foreign units can help you here. For example, here we could recruit some priests from a different uh, faction. We could also use summon spells for summoning shield units and the like. Whatever it might be, taking a notion into what your faction, what your culture is currently missing and watching for opportunities here you could 
conquer a city that has a different culture or pick up a summon spell whatever it might be you have the ability to just mix in things that your culture normally wouldn't have for example here i went and bought myself a barbarian shaman unit and that works really really well because this way i have support even though the dark culture doesn't so Foreign troops and summons give you the ability to dip into things that you normally wouldn't have, and I think it is totally mandatory to check out what you can pick up to make your armies more powerful. So, number 10, the last thing I want to talk about here is going into the experience point area as well, but more in regard of heroes and armies in general. So, what I wanted to say with all that gibberish here is that you should always try to keep your heroes busy and fighting and leveling up these guys are the only parts of your army that are basically well they aren't totally open end they also have a limit in their level but reaching that level limit is way way harder than reaching that limit on your units so you always want to share those xp come from combats with a hero if possible so if you're going for a hero ball strategy you will have a problem with that because you will be able to have only sown so many battles but in a general situation here you see i have one hero at this end of the map and the other hero at this end of the map i will hire soon another hero who will go for this end of the map i always try to have a hero soak up some xp that uh, fall off all, of all these uh, combats because this way i get the most out of these xp because troops can be easily trained by buildings there's also hero skills like for example i don't know does this guy have it yeah here experienced leader which gives a passive plus two experience for every troop per turn that's following that leader there's so many ways to rank up your troops but only so few ways to rank up your heroes namely fighting fighting and fighting so you should always have a eye on having your heroes close to the action otherwise you're giving away a lot of power okay so there's surely way more things to say to know about armies so let me know what you think i have missed let me know what you thought about the video i'm always happy to hear from you folks leave me a thumbs up if you enjoyed and consider subscribing i'd be delighted if you did there's also a playlist link to all the other age of uh, wonders tutorial videos that i made so if you like that one knock yourself out and give it a try apart from that Another big, big thanks to the supporters of the channel. I deeply appreciate all your help. It makes all of this possible and more. And if you want to check out Patreon, PayPal, and buy me a coffee, I'd be more than delighted. If not, well, thanks for watching this video. Already helped me out a lot that you were around here until the very end. Only 20 to 30% of all people are, actually. So thanks for that. Have a wonderful day and see you soon.